Hey everybody, in this video I wanted to talk about writing like a painter and how writing has really informed my practice and how it can help you out as well. So oftentimes when we are trying to create work about a certain subject, we can get really, really caught up in our minds about all these intricate little details and all these types of stories that we want to tell. Throughout the years, I've had a lot of students that oftentimes when they're starting on a project, we start off being full of excitement because the idea is new and fresh and all of this sort of thing. But our idea is still being, you know, our brain is still being super creative at that point. And we're engaging in what's called lateral thinking. Right? So we're connecting two disparate things together and our brain goes, wow, that's really cool and nice. And in writing, oftentimes you can have a lot of different apps. And a lot of these different apps are about world building and character building, especially. So oftentimes when people are starting off writing, they'll, they'll get caught up in the world building aspect, because that's the fun aspect. Getting to draw a map and figuring out where is this country going to be and where is this country going to be and figuring out a bunch of different characters, right? Like these are the goblins, these are the elves, you know, or, you know, this person is a sociopath and this is a woman that was an Olympic swimmer who kills her husband or whatever it is. We, we get these characters into our heads and we, we pontificate and ruminate on these, on these characters and what to do with them. And I've often seen that people conceptually, when you're struggling with painting and trying to figure out how do I make this painting about something, oftentimes they can go way, way, way too big, too fast. And this is gonna sound a little bit counterintuitive because a lot of people, whether they tell you to write or whether they're telling you to paint, they're gonna tell you to have a plan, they're gonna tell you to research, they're gonna tell you to look at other paintings, look at other artists, read their statements. All these things are good, right? But when the rubber hits the road, what you're gonna to have to engage in is writing or painting, that actual act. That's the most important part of doing either of these things. And that involves literally sitting your butt down in a chair, or if you're at a standing desk or at a standing easel or whatever, getting that brush in your hand, getting that pen in your hand, and just beginning. And here's a book that's kind of about that subject. Now, I don't wanna just say, just write, because if you just write, Maybe you're just gonna write a thousand pages that are awful. Or maybe if you just just paint, just sit down and paint, right? Maybe you're gonna make a thousand terrible paintings if you follow that advice. However, if all you do is plan, you're never gonna actually engage in the act of painting or the act of writing, and that's how a book gets written, or that's how a body of work actually gets created. Uh, one book that is really good about this is this book by Ray Bradbury called Zen in the Art of Writing. And this, this book oftentimes plays with the same idea. If you know Ray Bradbury, he wrote like Fahrenheit 451. But he was an extremely prolific short story writer. So he's a really fun one to look at um, in, ter in terms of writing short stories. And he talks a little bit about how important poetry is in writing and how he writes these science fiction short stories, right? And so we don't think of him as necessarily the most poetic person in the world. However, in poetry, we're just playing with pure feeling and pure words. It's all about metaphors and similes and these sorts of things. And we're playing with words to the extent where we're no longer just telling a story that goes from A to B. We're being very flowery with our language, I guess we could say. Painting is also kind of like poetry in this respect. And 
a lot of times when people want to start painting, and I know a lot of people watch my videos because they want to get better at shading and, you know, these sort of basic fundamentals of paintings, and there's plenty of channels that have a lot of information about all this fundamental stuff involved in painting. But if you're thinking about the idea generation involved with creating a body of work, then poetry, literature, think about these two places. Before you begin making up ideas in your head and stories in your head, start thinking or start reading poetry. Start reading literature. Doesn't matter what it is. You could read terrible science fiction paperbacks that you find at thrift stores or whatever. You can read uh, romance novels, you know? Doesn't matter what you want to read. But you need to start thinking more about characters in your work because unless it's purely abstract work, people are going to come to that work trying to figure out a story. And sometimes this gets a little bit annoying, right? Sometimes we get in, into this kind of Da Vinci Code way of looking at paintings, where we look at every single element in the painting and we think it's kind of like a symbol. It's like a code that needs to be discerned by a, a smart person who's lucky enough to crack the code. I don't think that's the way to write books. I don't think that's the way to make movies. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily the way to make paintings when they're so complicated that we need to read something else in order to understand this painting. The goal of a painting is to visually communicate an idea just through color, form, shadow, line, right? The idea with a story is similar. Now, of course, there's, there's, we break the rules. We've been breaking the rules about stories and narrative for a hundred years. If you want a, a perfect example of this, look at the book Finnegan's Wake by James Joyce. It's one of the most difficult book. It's written in like 180 languages at the same time. It's impossible to sit down and just open it up, somebody who's unfamiliar with it more in depth. You can't, literally cannot open up that book and understand what's happening in any way whatsoever. And that's part of that trajectory of modernism. But there's still characters in that book. There's still characters in that book. There's Henry Chimpton Earwicker and uh, Anna, Livy, Anna, Anna Livia Plimpton, I believe, are both of their names. But Joyce, throughout the book, he hides them in these different ways, using HRC and ALP throughout the book. And so this is as coded of a book as you could possibly imagine. They sell this book with a big, fat book. You know, the, you know Finnegan's Wake is like this, <laughs> this big, I don't know, um, probably 400 pages or so, 450 pages. But the annotations is like twice as thick. The annotations for that book is like 1,200 pages. Because every line of that book has different origins and has different meanings uh, within it. So it's an unbelievably complicated book. At the same time, there's still characters. There's still these basic elements that hold everything together. And so when I'm talking about painting and using characters in painting to tell a story that you want to tell, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to think, oh, this is the good guy and this is the bad guy and all this sort of stuff, right? It can be something more abstract than that, but using these fundamental elements in a painting, this is a character, this is how we look at characters, is going to be something that binds your work together and it's going to make somebody who's coming to your work um, be able to understand how to read it so to speak. The other person, the other book I would suggest reading besides Zen and the Art of Writing by Ray Bradbury is a, a book by Stephen King called On Writing. And Stephen King notoriously had a very regimented writing routine. And he talks about, I've seen in interviews when he's asked always, you know, how would you uh, tell a young kid 
who wants to get better at writing, what should they do? And um, essentially, Stephen, Stephen King says, you need to write every single day. And one of the things that we forget in this day and age, because we come up and we become so specialized now, is Stephen King was, before he ever got famous, before he ever published his first big novel, um, there were these magazines that would accept short stories for them, like Amazing Tales and Weird and all these sort of things. And you would get paid by the word. And you would submit these things. So you're writing every single day. And then they would make a stack of manuscripts. You can look for a YouTube video on Ray Bradbury, actually. It's like a 30-minute documentary they made in the 60s, which is pretty cool on uh, Ray Bradbury as well. And you can see in that documentary about him, he's physically typing up a short story. He has to physically put it into an envelope and ship it off. They might not even like it. You might have three copies of that short story. You know how much time it takes to make a 300 page copy of a book and send it to somebody who might not even want it. And so there existed this culture where there wasn't really a choice if you wanted to be a writer. You had to just write every single day and send off your stuff and hope somebody would pick it up. And through that process, you can begin writing with a sort of abandon that's needed in order to make great work. And this is the same thing with painting. If you start doing it every day and start thinking about it, I need to feed my family based on these paintings. I know that's probably a pretty um, intense proposal. But if you start doing that every single day, you know, on day, maybe from day three or day four, you're already going to get tired of it. You might get tired of it, and you're going to start feeling like you're in the gym, and you're on the stair stepper, right? And you got that little voice in your head that's telling you, okay, just give up, just give up. But you know you can keep stepping, right? So think that same way about painting, too. You know you can keep painting. So imagine if somebody paid you $100 every day to make a painting, and that's all you had to do was make one painting in four hours. You'd probably do that. And if you start thinking about it in this way, there's ways to do it too where you save money too. You can use masonite, get a big piece, eight foot by four foot sheet of masonite, or one by two meter sheet of masonite, have it cut into um, you know, small squares. In the US, they're 12 by 16. In Europe, it's 30 by 40 and you just cut it into those shapes and you'll get like 32 pieces for like, I don't know, maybe $30. Ends up being like a dollar for every painting that, you know, the masonite, which you're painting on. So you get a ton of these pieces of masonite and you always have way more surfaces. You can see I got all these down here too. If you look around the bottom of my studio, I got all those hanging out too. But when you have all these pieces of masonite, you just come in, and you're like, oh, gonna start churning out another one. You're not precious with it. And through that activity of doing that every single day, I bet something weird's gonna happen within a few weeks where all of a sudden it becomes more like habit. And this is a, this becomes more like a habit that you're doing every day. It's not work anymore. You want to start painting every day. You can't go without painting every day. You're addicted to painting every day. And you can do the same thing with writing. Try, try doing it for 30 minutes a day. Um, journalists talk about this too in their writing. People that have to write for newspapers and these sort of things. They would have to write every single day. And it didn't matter. You have to have 600 words done. Robert Crumb, the cartoonist, he was making illustrations for a card company. You know, they had to have a guy drawing cartoons for Hallmark cards. It, it wasn't Hallmark, but the equivalent of, you know, birthday cards and anniversary cards and you got to make all these characters. So he would go and sit down in a desk. Um, who's that painter in, um, I can't think of his name right now. It's Philadelphia, he's Alexander Konevsky. 
Alexander Konevsky, there's a great uh, interview with him, if you search for a podcast with him, where he talks about he worked for a telephone book company drawing little illustrations for like the air conditioner company and all this sort of stuff. Um, all these people that used to make movie posters, you look at Enzo Sciotti, this Italian movie poster designer. He's made thousands of different paintings of diff four different movies. And he wouldn't have any time to do it like we do now. You know, now we think of a movie poster, you got the graphic design person to do the font, you got this other person to make this character, you got another person to color correct, all this sort of stuff. Back then, they had the same guy drawing the font that made the mo movie poster, that was that guy or woman, right? That was that person making that. And so, you get into that mode and something weird is going to happen if you keep doing it. I well, I can't guarantee you. I hope it does. But I bet you something weird is going to start happening. And if you connect that to having some sort of story, that's called a series in painting, or a body of work around a certain theme, you're going to find a lot of success and you're going to be able to connect with other people. I mean, you look at my paintings, my paintings aren't the most normal painting um, in the world, but I feel super connected to them because I know the stories involved in these paintings and other people do as well. Your audience could be 20 people or it could be 20,000 people. But the goal should be to connect with other people. Otherwise, why are you making something? So check out those two books, Ray Bradbury's Zen in the Art of Writing, Stephen King's On Writing. Um, yeah, and I hope that helps. Go over to the website, check out oko.academy if you're interested in my mentorship program where I mentor one person individually for the series of six weeks. Get on board with that. Have a good day.